Welcome to my presentation on Baltic Sea policies and management. My name is Gerald uh, Scharnewski. I'm head of the Coastal Marine Management Group at the Leibniz Institute for Baltic Sea Research in Germany. And at the same time, I am professor at Klaipeda University. What is it about? You will get a brief background on the Baltic Sea, followed by the governance of the Baltic Sea, who is managing uh, the sea, Helcom. A background on EU policies and the management plan. So how is the status of the Baltic Sea improved? We have a short evaluation. Was it successful? And I finish with a summary. The Baltic Sea is one of the largest brackish seas worldwide and has a size of about 400,000 square kilometers. The river basins are four times larger. This means large land area are facing a smaller sea, so the sea is controlled by processes on land. And we have a high population with 85 million people. One speciality is that the Baltic Sea is brackish. In the south, north and east, major rivers are entering with fresh water. Altogether more than 250 rivers are draining into the sea and are discharging 660 cubic meters per year. This water is leaving the Baltic Sea at the Kattegat near Denmark. And as a compensation to this loss of fresh water, periodically salt water from the North Sea is entering the sea. It is entering at the bottom because the salt water is heavier. And as a consequence of these processes, we have strong horizontal salinity salt gradients in the Baltic Sea and vertical salinity gradients and even a salt barrier indicated by this red line which prohibits to a certain degree exchange of water. This uh, brackish character has implications. We have very different habitats and there are some areas where freshwater species dominate and others where we have uh, marine uh, species. But altogether, the number of species in brackish seas and in the Baltic Sea is relatively low. So while we have only 275 species in the central Baltic Sea, in the North Sea, we have more than 1,600. Another aspect that is very special is that the Baltic Sea is a young sea. It developed after the Ice Age, and this means still species are entering the sea. So we can say the Baltic Sea is very specific, and it is a fragile ecosystem. At the same time, the Baltic Sea is intensively used by humans. And human uses mean pressures to the Baltic Sea. This map indicates the accumulative pressures. And in red, you see high amounts of pressure. And this is mainly taking place in the south, Poland, Germany, and very much in the east, in the Gulf of Finland, Russia, Baltic States, and Finland. And this is a situation that lasts already for centuries. So the Baltic Sea was always under intensive use. As a consequence of these human uses and the pressure, we see a degradation of the Baltic Sea. And 
the Helsinki Commission was established as a reaction to that. And it was established already in 1974. And the Helsinki Commission wants to protect the marine environment of the Baltic Sea from all sources of pollution through intergovernmental cooperation between all nine surrounding states. And HELCOM is the governing uh, body of the Convention on the Protection of the Marine Environment of the Baltic Sea Area. So this is known as Helsinki Convention. And the joint visions of all these states is a healthy Baltic Sea environment with diverse biological components functioning in balance, resulting in a good ecological status and supporting a wide range of sustainable and social activities. Baltic Sea management can be regarded as an early best practice example and model for other regional seas in Europe and worldwide. So how does it look in detail? We have 10 contracting parties, including the EU, and they signed the convention in 74 and a renewed version in 1992. The convention itself defines the guiding principles and includes the obligations of the partners. And it de defines the joint vision, the protection of the Baltic Sea environment. Each party designates its own head of delegation, as well as working group members and external experts. And they work together in the Helsinki Commission. This is the highest decision-making uh, body and it meets annually. Additionally, there are thematic working groups. Task is to develop recommendations, policies and strategies. And they are even supported by experts who provide scientific knowledge and technical underpinnings. Everything is coordinated by the HELCOM Secretariat. And this is how HELCOM works. This pyramid shows on the bottom the data, the monitoring, and this is used to provide indicator information, fact sheets. They are aggregated into thematic assessments, for example, for eutrophication or hazardous substances, and they then are further aggregated into holistic assessments. And very important is that everything, every layer, is supported by science. So there are scientific reports and modeling as a basis for this work. We can say that HELCOM largely implements EU policies on the Baltic Sea level. But because it was quite early, it influenced the marine policy development in the EU as well. So what is the policy background? In the EU, most important is the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. It aims to achieve a good environmental status of the European Union marine waters and wants to protect the resource base upon which marine-related economic and social activities depend. So it provides the legislative framework, but more important is it defines a clear stepwise implementation, including a strategy and a timetable. And it provides 11 so-called descriptors, 
parameters that are used for defining the good environmental uh, status in all regional seas. We can say that the Marine Strategy Framework Directive strongly determines today the HELCOM work and it increased the importance of a HELCOM about the descriptors. So how is the good environmental status uh, being defined? This includes biodiversity, non-indigenous species, so the so-called alien species, commercial fish species, food webs, beautification, seafloor integrity, hydrographical conditions, contaminants, contaminants in seafood, which is very important in southern Europe, marine litter, and underwater noise. How does the implementation of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive uh, looks like? First step is the so-called initial assessment. And here, the first part is an analysis of the essential characteristic and current environmental status of those waters. In the Baltic Sea, this has a long tradition and this reflects the situation in the early 2000s. On the left-hand side, three indicators are used. It's eutification, the state of hazardous substances, and biodiversity. And just judging from the colors, most things are red. So this means the status is poor. And if we aggregate this information into an overall assessment on the right-hand side, not much is changing. We see red colors dominating. So in the mid 2000s, the Baltic Sea was in a poor state. How to go on? The next step after this initial assessment is an analysis of the predominant pressures and impacts, including human. And idea is to get an overview about what is ruling, what is driving uh, the seas. Human activities are usually called drivers on the left-hand side. And the resulting pressures, the consequences, are shown on the right-hand side. And you see that this is a very complex uh, pattern. And Examples are for drivers are land claim, aquaculture, and agriculture, of course. And you immediately see that agriculture influences the Baltic Sea in many ways, causes pressures, an input of nutrients, input of hazardous substances, input of organic matter, input of litter, and last not least, human microbial pathogens. New in this uh, directory is the third step of this assessment. This is an economic and social analysis. Idea is to have a look, what are the costs of degradation? This is an example from the early 2000s. And it shows how much would it cost to bring the Baltic Sea into a good status? And what is the economic benefit of transferring um, the sea into this status? What is the benefit for the uh, humans? And if you compare the numbers cost benefits, you see that the costs and the benefits are the same order of magnitude. Sometimes benefits are higher. So from an economic point of view, it makes sense to invest in environmental protection. There is a net economic win from it. 
If you go through the numbers, you see that they differ very much. So the problematic with these economic assessments is that they very much depend on assumptions and on the approach. So they are not that reliable. A more recent approach is the so-called ecosystem service approach. And ecosystem services are the benefits that people derive from ecosystems. Idea behind, especially the sketch on the right hand side, is to visualize how marine activities depend on ecosystem services and influence in ecosystem services. This shows the relationship between nature and economy. And if we go into the uh, picture, you see this big ball, marine tourism of high economic importance, indicated by the size of the ball. And you see that it's on the right hand side. So tourism very much depends on ecosystem services, on a good water quality, on a nice view. On the other hand, the impact of tourism on the system is only medium. This is very different with respect to fisheries on the top right. Fisheries does not have really an, a high economic importance in the Baltic Sea. But it very much depends on ecosystem services provided by the sea. Habitats for fish, the amount of commercial fish. And it has a very strong effect on these ecosystem services. Negative effect. Especially ground touching, trawling. It destroys habitats. So very influential. Another example is wind energy on the left bottom. It does not need much of sea services, just a place to build a wind farm. And it has some impact on the ecosystem, but not very strong one, local one, possibly on currents and on the production of organic matter. So this new approach is meant to make people aware of the economic consequences of a poor ecological status. The next aspect in the implementation of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive is then, after monitoring, the program of measures. So the member states shall set up and implement programs of measures to achieve the good environmental status in their own marine waters. And this program should address each of the 11 descriptors. In the Baltic Sea, this is done by the Baltic Sea Action Plan. And the updated version from 21 has as a goal a healthy and resilient Baltic Sea ecosystem. And three major aspects are tackled. A Baltic Sea unaffected by eutrophication, a Baltic Sea unaffected by hazardous substances, and environmentally sustainable sea-based activities. This covers many aspects, many descriptors of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. So the Baltic Sea Action Plan largely implements the Marine Strategy Framework Directive idea. Why is there such a strong focus on eutrophication? This picture gives the answer. Nutrient concentrations and, as a response, intensive algae developments and many negative consequences like hypoxia or um, turbid waters have by far the highest cumulative impact on the sea uh, quality. And as a second aspect, hazardous substances are important. 
So eutrophication, nutrient loads, is still a major challenge in the Baltic Sea. Consequently, the Baltic Sea Action Plan defines for each of the sea regions of the Baltic Sea so-called maximum allowable nutrient inputs for nitrogen and phosphorus as the main eutrophication driving elements. And how successful is it? So what is the progress? This is a picture most recently uh, prepared by Helcom. And for nitrogen, you see that several areas are green for phosphorus as well. Bothnian Bay, Bothnian Sea, up in the north near Finland and Sweden, already have nutrient loads below the maximum allowable amount. And this maximum allowable input means this sea would stay in a good ecological status, in a good eutrophication status. But the problem is that some areas are still red. And this is the Baltic proper and the Gulf of Finland, the largest area, the central area, is not uh, in a good status and is not the amounts of nutrients entering are still too high. So, we have a success. Is it reflected already in the status of the sea? Here, the example of eutrophication again. And there are three sub-indicators, nutrient levels, direct effects like algae developments, indirect effects like water transparency or lack of oxygen. And these three aspects are put together into a total assessment. And to make a long story short, everything is red. So the Baltic Sea is still in a moderate, poor, or even in some areas in a bad state. And this is not only true for eutrophication. If you have a look on these bars, the second one are the hazardous substances. The entire bar is nearly red, indicating a poor status. The bar below non-indigenous species, the so-called alien species, we still have major problems with them. So a poor status as well. And as a consequence, everything below reflecting biodiversity is not in a good status either. There's one example. When you go down, you see the water birds. And the water birds are, to a large degree, in a good ecological status. So they benefit already from the situation. Let me summarize. So what did we learn from it? So the European Union coastal and marine policy is comprehensive and quite ambitious. And most important is the umbrella legislation, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. This includes other directives, such as the Water Framework Directive. Very important is that it defines an implementation strategy and a timetable. And it's not a one-way road. It is a repetitive cycle. So once you went through the entire cycle and the state is still not good, you again go through it. So this will keep us active for the next decades, very likely. In the Baltic Sea, this policy is implemented through the Helsinki Commission, HELCOM. And the HELCOM Baltic Sea Action Plan already provides a comprehensive set of targets and measures towards a healthy and resilient Baltic Sea ecosystem. It implements the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. 
we saw that this policy already shows some positive effects, at least with respect to reduced pressures. But the state of the Baltic Sea did not improve significantly. So the state is still poor and not acceptable. The point is simply that we have a water residence time in the Baltic Sea of 25 to 30 years. This means once a pollutant or a nutrient entered the sea, it stays for decades. And this makes the recovery of the sea a long-lasting and time-consuming process. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention.